Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our final keynote event of the day. I'm Madison Skinner, uh, co-chair of the 19th Annual Social Enterprise Conference, Capital for Good, and an MBA student at Columbia Business School. Today, I have the honor of introducing our keynote speaker, Abigail Disney, CEO and co-founder of Fork Films. Abigail is a filmmaker, philanthropist, activist, and Emmy Award-winning director of The Armor of Light. She produced the groundbreaking documentary, Pray the Devil Back to Hell, and co-created the PBS series, Women, War, and Peace. She is the chair and co-founder of Level Forward, a storytelling company that focuses on systemic change through creative excellence. Abigail advocates for social movements, focusing on women's right, rights and gender justice. Abigail will be moderated by Mona Sinha, board chair of Women Moving Millions and the ERA Coalition Fund for Women's Equality and advisory board member of our very own Tamer Center for Social Enterprise. Mona is an advocate for gender equality in business and society, parlaying her career in finance, marketing, and restructuring to work at the intersection of social justice and women's leadership. Mona is currently the board chair of Women Moving Millions, which is a women-led fund that invests in women and girls as agents of change with over 330 committed members. She is also board chair of the ERA Coalition Fund for Women's Equality, which seeks to codify the 28th Constitutional Amendment of Equal Rights on the Basis of Sex. She is co-founder of Raising Change to address the funding gap in mission-driven organizations for social change. She also founded the Asian Women's Leadership University to bring liberal arts pedagogy to train future women leaders. Thank you for joining us today. And Mona, I'm gonna hand it over to you now. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Abby, you have just done a superb TED talk entitled Dignity Isn't a Privilege, It's a Worker's Right. I recommend everybody should watch that. It's beautifully recorded. Congratulations on that. Tell us a little bit about the values that your grandfather and his brother stepped into when they founded Disney, both the theme parks and the company. Talk to us a little bit about having an inside view into their dreams and how do you see it translated today? You know, we just saw the news of Disney laying off 25,000 people and in light of the CEO roundtable last year, focusing not just on shareholder value, but on stakeholder value, what is Disney doing today that's right or wrong? You know, that's a, a painful question for me right in this moment. Um, but uh, I will say that uh, I grew up inside of that company. I was very uh, intimately connected with my grandfather. He was the less famous of the two, but um, he brought all of himself to that, uh, the job of being that um, leader. <laughs> He, he has, there's one expression that's attributed to him if you go to the internet, you know, because Walt obviously was much more famous. So I'm surprised that you can find anything that my grandfather had to say. But one of the things he had to say was, it's not hard to make decisions when you know what your values are. Um, so my, my grandfather and his brother came to the work of creating that company from an impulse of creativity and generativeness. Um, and they ran it as a place that was like a garden um, that needed to be tended to, that needed to be taken care of. Small parts of it, large parts of it had to be seen too. They, they, they were not the people who came into the garden and just stripped everything off of the vines. Mm. And, and in, the, in the 40 years since my grandfather died, um, it has gone from a company that, that was about generation to a company that was about exploitation. And now it's really it become a company about ex extraction. Um, I personally am um, so horrified by the falling out between Gavin Newsom and Bob Iger um, that they became public. I know that they've been arguing for a while about this, but um, Disney feels it can open the park safely. We, we don't know for sure whether in Orlando they're spreading the disease. And I just can't imagine um, that putting the 
the profits of an institution ahead of the health of people. So there, there's a lot that Disney does right, a lot that Disney does right. But some time ago, the idea that the shareholder was the only thing that matter, mattered got put out in front of who are these people that, that make the value for us every day? You know, this isn't a goose that lays a golden egg. This is the product of, of intense work and commitment and dedication by human beings. Mm -hmm. And the value that my grandfather brought to it, that I think a lot of people brought to business before 1970 was, you know, you work in partnership with the people who do the cleaning and the cooking and the sewing and the whatever else. Um, and, you know, they deserve to have a wage they can live on. So when... When a company pulls down record profits, but people still can't put on the table, something's gone horribly amiss. Yeah, completely. I mean, you, like many of us, are at heart an activist. Um, and I feel like in these times, especially, we live in such a paradox because the contradiction in our lives is that we have such complex and daunting challenges that are just so exposed right now. And yet we have everything that we need to create a just and equitable and beautiful life. Um, you're also a supreme organizer and a voice. And, you know, how do we organize ourselves to meet these challenges in relationship with ourselves, with each other, like you said, the human beings who create the value in our lives and our planet? You know, we can't forget Mother Earth. I think we're going to think, have to think holistically about this problem because, you know, at, at root, it's a soul problem. Mm -hmm. you know, it is a soul problem. There was a there was a sort of a shift in the way we understood business and businessmen, and where they stand in society and, and what they what they contribute. And and you know, businessmen and I I use the word men consciously because they were mostly men in the day um, were seen as community leaders, um, but they weren't offered the kind of rock star status fifty years ago that they're offered today. And it, it says so much about the shift in our understanding of what it is that we should admire that, you know, you're more likely to find Steve Jobs on the cover of Time magazine than you would say Reverend William Barber or someone mm -hmm. else like that. So, so we have had a, a shift in consciousness. It's, you can see it in, you know, from the days when Oliver Stone had Gordon Gecko saying greed is good to, you know, pretty much any film about business now. There's been a shift in values that was a very conscious shift, honestly. It was created by very consciously by people. And that was followed by a shift in policy. And the policy shift was very clear and very conscious. You know, we stopped enforcing antitrust laws. We, mm -hmm. we kneecapped the unions and changed work-related laws. The first thing Ronald Reagan did when he came in was to crush the union. And that was a signal he was sending about how there's a new day in America. Um, you know, the, the, the inequality problem in the United States, we talk about it a lot, but we don't put it into, into real understandable terms. And I think it's really important to know, like many of us look at Russia and say, that's a situation we don't want to have in this country. Well, I've got news for you. Out of the 39 OECD company, countries, mm -hmm. the United States ranks 33rd out of 39, and Russia is at 29. They're beating us, actually. They have a better Gini coefficient than we have. And the countries that we're in the company of, Bulgaria and Turkey and Mexico, are not companies we want to be countries we want to be keeping company with in terms of inequality. So we've already lost so much ground. And and often what what they will tell you when you say we need to do something about inequality, they'll say, but you'll destroy the economy and you'll turn us all into socialists. You know, yeah. Denmark, Iceland. Slow, Slovak Republic, Czech Republic. These are not these. They call themselves democratic socialists, but the, but socialists in the terms of Stalin is nowhere near the equation. So we have a lot of room to move, a lot of latitude. We need to change laws about living wages. We need to change laws about unions. We need to start enforcing antitrust law. We need to get you know collect the taxes we're owed to start with by funding enough IRS agents to actually enforce. We need to stop enforcing against low-income people. Low-income people are far more likely to be audited than wealthy people. We need to stop the offshoring of profits and the offshoring of resources. There's a million things we can do in terms of the tax code and the legal system to change this. And then we need to go to the business schools because the business schools were really kind of the, the forge in which this mm -hmm. was, this was um, created, this kind of new way of thinking 
about shareholders. And when Milton Friedman said, you know, everyone does better as long as everybody's out for themselves in this, right. he offered a little bit of a moral cover to, to people to say, no, but I'm being a good citizen. If I'm greedy, then everybody profits. But we, we know that's not true. We, we, you know, if you might have been able to say that 30 years ago when we didn't have enough decades of this experience to, to, to show us. But we now really know that shareholder value drives poor behavior. Companies that primarily pursue shareholder value tend not to do that well over the long term. Um, and that the companies that really see all their stakeholders as, as equally important in the scheme of things um, tend to do better over the long term. The, the economies in the pandemic that are doing well and holding up and most resilient right now are all of the same economies with the low Gini coefficients. The economies mm -hmm. that are teetering and are really doing poorly are the ones like the United States with high inequality numbers. So, so there's no, it's not just a case we're making because we're nice. We're making a case because we want to build a strong, healthy economy to hand off to our children and grandchildren. Um, so there's much to be done. It has to be done in our hearts and our minds. Um, and it has to be done in the electoral system and in the legislatures. Yeah, completely. I mean, hearts and minds are great, but I'm for action, as are you. Yeah. Uh, you know, we are the only industrial country in the world that doesn't guarantee equal rights in our constitution. Yeah. And I know when I stepped into the work of the ERA and I found that out, I was really shocked. Yeah. As an immigrant, you know, my whole American dream was that everybody is equal. And that's actually not, not true. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I was reflecting on that in our recent vice presidential debates that, you know, Senator Harris was up there with Mike Pence. And actually, the two of them don't have equal rights in our country. No. So that's something to reflect upon. And she clearly she doesn't have equal right to speak without being interrupted. <laughs> Correct. I mean, come on. It was just, it was so rude. But anyway, we both invest in social change. You know, we both invested in um, the documentary film Disclosure. In fact, I met Amy Scholder and Sam Fitter at your house. So thank you for bringing me that incredible opportunity. And we both also invested in what the Constitution means to me, which was nominated for a Tony Award and then got me interested in the work I do with the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, so how do you see, you're so close to this and you're a funder and a creator, um, how do you see the art form as a messaging platform for issues that we're talking about you know, this afternoon about equal rights and so forth? And you recently created Level Forward um, to amplify that voice. Tell us what you're doing with that and has that even shifted at this time in terms of your priorities and what you're funding? Um, I, you know, I've been almost all of my adult life trying to figure out how to make the world a better place for want of a better expression as tired as that is. Um, but un until I stepped into um, the world of changing the narrative and thinking about the narrative differently, the public narrative that we all hold, like for instance, violence is inevitable. That's a public mm -hmm. a narrative we all hold and that you know men get there first and, and those kinds of things. Um, until we started looking at that narrative, we, I don't think we have any chance of making any kind of difference. And, and the thing about artists and art in general is they don't explain. Activists always explain. They go right to the center of it and they give you all the numbers and they give you all the facts and, and, they, and they really want you to feel the urgency. And, and people can't hear that most of the time. Mm -hmm. What they need is to have it, uh, I guess, seep into their consciousnesses and imaginations. And storytelling art and all the different arts are ways of, of talking about things in a way that really stick um, inside of a consciousness. I mean, I'm, I just know, I haven't been in a movie in so long and I miss it so much, but when yeah. you're there in the dark, you know, and there's nothing else hop happening and you, you are watching a really good movie, there's a way in which you kind of forget yourself, you know, you forget that you're in a body even, you forget who you are, you forget what was bugging you 10 minutes ago. You, like you go to another alternative space. That is a very important moment. And what Hollywood tends to do with that moment is criminal, you know, because they open you up like that and they stuff you through with violent imagery, um, with sexist imagery, with, you know, every manner of, of what we don't need more of in our consciousnesses. Um, and so I felt like I can't really, I'm not big enough to change the, in the Hollywood industrial complex, but I, I can at least contribute what little I can to, to the opposite direction, to, to see if I can get people to that 
heart opening space, which takes, it's hard. You can't, you know, you can't make that stuff up. You need creative vision to do it. And then once they're in that space to, um, to offer them something worth taking home. Um, that's how the world changes by changing people. And so tell us a little bit more about Level Forward and what are the projects you're looking at? And, uh, you know, I know you've launched a few already, which have been very successful. Yeah, yeah, we did really well last year on Broadway because we were involved in the retelling of Oklahoma, which is, was, you know, it's, an, it's a Rodgers and Hammerstein musical. What, what, what can we possibly learn from a Rodgers and Hammerstein musical? Except that if you re-see it from the viewpoint of a country stuffed full of guns and violence and with such a violent narrative of its origins, suddenly you understand yourself differently when you look at that, at that musical. So that was very powerful, what the Constitution means to me, which you're also a producer in. And um, that was a beautiful, beautiful way of understanding where women fit in the constitution or never fit in the constitution and why the ARA is necessary. And, but again, if, if she just told you all those things, instead of telling you embedded in a story, you wouldn't have come home quite as on fire as you were when you came home from that. Um, so we right now, um, we're working on a bunch of different feel, films. We have a film called American Woman coming out soon, mm -hmm. which is actually um, a really interesting imagining of the Patty Hearst kidnapping story mm -hmm. from Pat, the pet perspective of one of the kidnappers um, mm -hmm. who was an Asian American woman, this is true, um, and who was committed to nonviolence um, and who spent time with Patty Hearst and they developed a friendship and tried to escape together. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful film. Um, and uh, we're, we're working on developing a, um, a, a shared workspace for women of color who want to create together. It's called The Labs and it's a platform for them to go and share music and figure out how to get copyrights and share with each other. Oh, I have this really good set designer, call her over there, all that kind of stuff. The Labs has been an incredible platform for us. We're, we're building it together and we're using it. We just had a, a gathering for the Center of Popular Democracy on it um, to talk about the coming election. There's that, So we have all kinds of stuff going. Obviously we're working really heavily um, online right now um, this has been a really frustrating time, but you know, if you're creative, you just keep going forward. Um, and I think when, when we get to a point where we can gather again, I think we're going to have a lot of interesting skills we've built through this process, but we're just, you know, the, the message and the messenger are hard to separate from each other. Mm -hmm. it's why it's so important whose stories we tell and how we tell them. And, um, it is, it is not, um, it is not a frivolous thing to say that um, women need a chance to get behind the camera and, mm -hmm. and, and talk about what it is that they experience. I, I, I remember so vividly my friend, uh, Kirsten Johnson, who's a great documentary cinematographer for years and came out with a film called Camera Person recently about her experience of being a doc camera person. She has a film out now, mm -hmm. which you should go see called, what was it, Bruce? Johnson is dead. I can't now. I can't remember the name of it. But anyway, it, it fantasizes her killing her father multiple times because he, he, he's <laughs> getting old, and she couldn't stand it. So it was her way of dealing with the oncoming grief. Um, but uh, I, I always looked at the way she would she would set herself up relative to the camera, um, and and I know this maybe is ridiculous. It sounds crazy, but men take the camera and they consume um, the landscape. Right women get into the camera and it's like they climb in the lens and they witness. Mm. And I know that sounds like a crazy generalization to make, but there's a very different and subtle way that women go about filmmaking than men do. The same with people of color and anybody who's been marginalized because the confidence to simply consume everything in front of you, front of you isn't there because of your experience. So it's really important for us to get this subtle change because it, it changes the way we see and understand and receive these stories. Yeah, the perspectives. I mean, in Oklahoma, I remember being so struck that your main protagonist was a woman in a wheelchair. Yeah, yeah. Right? Amazing. What a and, last year, yeah. And Tony, exactly, which was incredible. And also, in Disclosure, one of the things that really drew me to um, that doc film was that they hired people who were trans people. 
and who had lived that experience. And they actually, where there wasn't somebody who was qualified to do a particular role, they trained them, which is yeah. just incredible, you know, yeah. and no surprise it took them five years to make this yeah. film. But that was that this life changing. Yeah, this and this is this is how you prove to the people who are there in Hollywood saying, but I can't find the talent and they're not right. there. That's just nonsense. Yeah. Yeah. So go with Level Four. I'm so grateful and so excited to see what else is coming out of, of this fund. I mean, Abby, you're such a force, and I'm so grateful to call you a friend, honestly. Uh, we're here today talking to Columbia Business School students who are going to go out there in the world and lead organizations and business practices. You know, what advice can we offer them so that they can combine these sound business practices with the social and the gender lens as they will eventually step into the leadership roles and run these companies? Mm. Two, two things, two things. You know, the business schools are where um, the, the shareholder primacy myth was perpetrated and where what right now we're dealing with CEOs of a generation that came through business schools mm -hmm. when they were teaching that. And I know most business schools are teaching something a little different than that. I, I know many of them have seen the light and brought in ethics classes and that kind of thing. Um, but the ethics class should not be around the edges of your education. The, the ethics, the idea of ethics should be the core of your experience. Mm -hmm. onto which you add these skills that you get from your business school. So the first thing I would say is never, ever, ever let anyone tell you that if you have an ethical concern or you think something is violating your core moral vision, never let anybody tell you that it's irrelevant, that it's stupid, that it's a side issue that's a non sequitur. It is never that. And I know it takes a lot of courage to always speak up with it. I was always the one in my family's company. My God, they would roll their eyes every time I opened my mouth. But you know what? They couldn't fire me. So, um, <laughs> so, so you know, try, try, be brave. In yeah. the long run, yes, I couldn't be fired. It's easy for me to say, be safe. But nevertheless, in the long run, I've never been wrong to uh, express my, my reservation, um, even though in the short term, it, it didn't help me. Um, and the other one is just um, remember there's plenty. There's such a thing as plenty. Like mm -hmm. the, the desire to have a lot is like chasing the horizon, right? You'll run forever and you'll never get there. Plenty is a number I think we all will recognize when we see it. And, and plenty comes long before the B word comes into it. Mm -hmm. I, I was just reading this statistic that that if you took all of the $19 trillion in income Americans make and the $100 trillion in personal wealth and you divide it up evenly among every American, every American would make $140,000 a year and have $800,000 in wealth. Um, yes, it would put a crimp in Jeff Bezos' lifestyle, I imagine, but, but I, I can't imagine there isn't anyone in this country who can't find their way to a happy, satisfying life with that kind of money. I am, of course, not suggesting we do that. But what I am suggesting is that we take this in our, our heads and say, there's plenty, you know, and, and, and I, I might like to be a billionaire, but, you know, really $999 million will be fine. But <laughs> let's, let's be real about this. We are talking about amounts of money and numbers that just, they make no sense. And, and if you're what, that's what you're chasing, you will never be happy. Yeah, well, thank you for that wisdom. I think it applies to all of us, not just the business school um, students. Abby, thank you. This was a great conversation. I know the students and the participants here have some questions for you. So I will hand it back to the team to, I know people have been typing away in the Q and A box and, uh, Maybe we can share some questions with Abby. Well, I looked at one of them already. Oh, there you are, Madison. Okay. Hi, sorry, I had some technical difficulties. Um, thank you, both of you. This has been such a wonderful conversation so far. Um, and one of the questions here at the top is about the role of unions. And I think that this is, you know, a topic that 
Uh, we probably don't cover enough in business school, but uh, definitely warrants conversation about what is the role of organized labor. Um, and so I'd love for you to expand on what you see as the role of unions um, and what can be done around organized labor now. That is such a good question. That is so, so important. And what you just said, Madison, is really important too. And, and if your business school is not covering you something you think should be covered, you need to be an advocate for that point of view inside your business school. Because if it's not going to come from you, where is it going to come from? Yeah. Um, and the fact that business, business schools tend not to talk about labor is a really important first lesson in the idea of how labor and, and business management relate, right? They have nothing to do with each other. They're nemeses. They shouldn't be talking to each other. There is an eternal tension that exists in all businesses between labor and management because management always benefits when costs are down and labor always wants more money, partly because that's a natural human desire. Um, but the, the tension needn't be a question of dominance um, there's something that they call in physics, optimal tension. Mm -hmm. um, what happened was that Ronald Reagan came in first and then others after him, and they put their thumb on the scale of what had been a relatively optimal state of tension in the early 80s. And that's why that PATCO strike in the, in the 80s was so important. Um, for those of you who don't know what it was, it was the air traffic controllers who, who hadn't gotten a raise in many, many years. They asked for more money and better hours and just the normal things unions asked for. Um, Reagan had actually run on the idea that he was going to support the union. Um, but when he came in, within about three months of inauguration, he shut the union down. He locked out all the workers. He also, by the way, banned them from ever having federal jobs of any kind ever again and hired non-union workers to replace them. Um, and there was a, I can't remember the line, but there was a business professional who said, we heard that loud and clear. It was a message um, that, that labor law wasn't going to be enforced and that unions had no friend in the government. So w when you watch those charts show you the decline in real wages for workers and that, that plummeting of all the benefits from healthcare to pensions and the rest of it, that all was a direct consequence of the, of the kneecapping of labor. They lost all their power. So the role labor needs to play is one that government supports. First of all, they need to um, pass a better and enforce the labor laws on the books. Um, and, then, and then we need to support unions. I mean, we, unions, the narrative shifted and unions became a reviled um, entity. And so, you know, all we get is mob movies about unions. But you know what? We have weekends because of unions. We have eight-hour days because of unions. You know, they, we have worker safety protections because of unions. So there are laws on the books that need enforcing, which means you can't underfund OSHA, you can't underfund the NLRB, and the government needs to support the laws that are already on the books. And then we need to look out, look at how to empower workers so that they can negotiate. This is a fundamental being able to negotiate. Yeah, uh, agreed on, on the negotiation being sort of a linchpin for effective uh, collaboration between labor and management. Um, I'm, I'm seeing two questions here that I'm going to combine into one um, around what is, you know, the opportunity and also the challenges for women filmmakers, for women of color filmmakers, how do they um, get their ideas out there? How do they work on social justice topics? Um, and what advice would you have to both women and also women of color um, who are trying to be leaders in this space, much like you are? Well, there's a lot of noise out there about women and women of color, especially being able to have their turn. And, and there are some funds now, um, but, but they're still infinitesimal as compared against what really happens in Hollywood and what really gets spent. Um, so we need to continue to do advocacy. We need to raise cane about the fact that um, so few women are directing, so few women of color write, direct, do any of the, the, the crafts that are considered to be intellectual. Um, it, you know, if you come from a class of people that doesn't have any personal wealth as a class, it's very unlikely you're going to be able to become a starving artist, interestingly, because being a starving artist is a luxury of the middle class. 
Um, so we need to find a way to support people from low income backgrounds um, to get into the arts. We need to go seek them. We need to find them and we need to find a way that they can build viable, sustainable lives while also letting us know what they believe by, by making art. Um, so that's not telling women filmmakers what they can do. Obviously, they want to be on the receiving end of all that help. And um, I'll just tell you that people like Mona, people like me, and there are a lot of others of us are doing everything we can to build the power um, of these organizations that support women and people of color. And, um, and each of these supports each other. So while you're in there scrapping and scraping away on the, on the low side of the totem pole, have faith, first of all, that, that if you do your work and if you follow your passion and if you really speak the truth, it will find its way and you just have to keep at it. Support each other. It is, again, a question of plenty. There is not one director job out there. There are plenty for all of you. So don't see the people around you as your competition. See them as your colleagues and support each other because you'd be amazed at how many opportunities come laterally to you. And, and say yes. Say yes to everybody. Say yes to everything. Art that comes from yes is the art that people want to see. Great. Thank you for that. Um, we had a question about uh, the sort of how Disney has lost its way. And um, the person wants to know what you think caused this. And what do you think the cautionary tale is for other companies, if there is one? I think to contrast that, you know, um, Disney is also doing, you know, pretty well in a lot of its new businesses. So yeah. help us understand what you see that balance being. Yeah, the the um, the the change in the Walt Disney Company actually started when my grandfather passed. He was it was 1971. It, that happens to be a year after Milton Friedman published his famous op-ed. It also happens to be the same year that Lewis Powell sent the memo out. I don't know if you know what that is, but Lewis Powell put a memo out. He later became a Supreme Court justice, but at the time he was a, a lawyer for the Chamber of Commerce. And he basically um, laid out a map um, for what you would do if you would make this a more business friendly country. Um, and everything that he laid out in that has happened. You know, they've stacked law school with conservatives. They've built, um, they built their uh, think tanks and the you, you have to go find it. It's easily Google to go look for the Powell memo. Um, so all of the, there were deliberate things happening at that time. Um, and they also had the benefit of, I think the culture was ready to shift. The culture was ready to come out of the 1960s and, and find something that felt less anarchic. Um, and so all those things came together and Ronald Reagan was elected in the 1980s. And what you saw then was the rise of what we at the time called yuppies, um, which were young professional people who had gotten their MBAs, who came to New York in the business world and who wanted to make a quota killing. Um, and the economy we have now is the result of what happens when you, you educate people without a moral compass. So my grandfather died right at the, at the front end of that. And it was from 1971 on, it was the first time in its existence that the company what, did not have a family member running it. What came in in his place were MBAs. And MBAs, uh, philosophies about how to run business evolved along with the culture, you know, um, pensions needed to go. Uh, people needed to be shifted from full-time employees to hourly employees. Um, the wages had to be pushed down on. We had to squeeze more productivity out of everybody without giving them any, any more money for that. Um, and the profits were going to be the only way of measuring our success. That, that is, a perfect synecdoche of what happened in American business more broadly. So what went wrong at Disney is precisely what went wrong in America, um, which was that we became singularly focused on profits. And, and honestly, uh, you know, they have, they have bought their way to a lot of creative, uh, creative success, but they haven't really created their way to a lot of creative success. And the new CEO this is really the culmination of this evolution, is someone who's never held a creative position at the company ever, um, which to me is a statement of principle on the part of the company that it's not a creative company anymore. It's an extractive company. It might as well be in the mining business. Someone from Disney television once said to me, basically here, this is the deal. I work at a butcher shop. I have one piece of salami. 
I'm not getting any more salami, so I have to slice the salami as thin as I possibly can. So that is not a generative company, and it will. This is not a sustainable way to exist in a creative business. So, so it is a not good for the company over the long term what they're doing, um, and b it's because it lost its way. I'm sorry to say, because the MBAs kind of took it there. Yeah, I, I love how you juxtapose sort of like generative versus extractive, and what are the different principles that underlie those. Um, yeah. Going back to what you were talking about around storytelling and narrative, because I'm, I completely agree with you that those are very powerful ways to uh, change hearts and minds, but also influence uh, legislation. Um, what do you think are some of the stories we need to tell or the narratives that we need to convey, convey as we think about the largest issues facing us today? Climate change, gender equality, income inequality, social justice, et cetera. Um, how do you think about that? You know, um, the tendency is to want to tell stories that like reveal the pain. Um, I've spent time in war zones and working with women in refugee camps. And when you come home from that, all you want to do is just take everybody by the lapel and say, I need you to feel this. How can you not be feeling this? Um, and, but that's not the story we need to be telling because, the primary feeling, especially during the pandemic now, is that we have no control, that nobody cares what we think and nobody cares what we have to say. So the stories we need to be telling are the stories of us, like because the hope going forward is us. And what, what young people have done in media um, and in a way that I can't keep up with, honestly, is, is by taking command of the stories you know, on TikTok, on YouTube and other places um, and working incredibly flexibly and, and quickly and really adaptively. Um, and the stories that are coming from young people, whether from conventional platforms or unconventional platforms are, are the stories that make me the most hopeful. Like all we get, all us old people who read the New York Times and whatever, all we get when we hear about media especially on YouTube, is how the right wing has taken it over and it's horrible. Uh, I also know that there are massive amounts of incredibly great things happening there. Creativity, decency, um, good um, analysis, social analysis, and, more, and moral critique. Um, so I think the stories we need to tell are those stories. We need to keep at it um, in the environments where young people are communicating with each other, we need to sort of let go of the traditional platforms, broadcast television, you know, the streamers and so forth, and, and let the internet do what it was built to do, which is to be a lateral medium, to be more like a spider web than a ladder. Because that is how, because people are predominantly good. And so when we flatten it out and we let people communicate in groups with each other, 99% of it, is, is going to be redemptive, positive, and it's going to make us feel stronger and better about ourselves. Maybe 98%, but you know. Um, I, I appreciate that. As somebody who discovered TikTok over the summer, I was blown <laughs> away by the uh, amazing content generated by young people and especially around social justice issues. Um, a little bit more specific to you now and a little bit more personal. If you were to sit down with your late 20s self in that marvelous living room behind you, um, <laughs> what would the conversation look like and what advice would you pass along to your younger self? Oh, that's such a good question. That's such a good question. You know, my grandmother always said youth is wasted on the young and I thought that was such a mean thing to say, but it sure was wasted on me. <laughs> so first of all, you're not as fat as you think you are. <laughs> You look better in photos than you think you do. And, uh, and none of that really matters anyway. Just stop worrying about it. Um, the, um, I wish I had known that um, it was okay to trust my judgment. You know, that when my head was screaming, like, that doesn't sound right, that doesn't sound right, I was right. And then I needed to follow that. Um, and like every dumb thing I've ever done, I've done either because I was afraid or because I was not trusting my, my my voice inside, not my will, <laughs> you know, but that, that good voice deep, deep, deep in you that knows the difference between right and wrong. Um, and 
I, you know, I sat in a meeting with my family I was investing in private equity and we were talking about um, a company that was investing in a new tire hitch for SUVs. This was 20 years ago. And I said, I'm sorry, but should we be investing in SUVs? <laughs> And, you know, honestly, they, I thought if they could have beaten me senseless, they would have beaten me senseless. Um, but that was just at the very beginning of my understanding that, like, I, I wasn't going to be involved in this unless it was doing the right thing, even if the right thing wasn't going to be popular. And if there was no way for me to do that there, I needed to go find a place for me to do it elsewhere. Because what's the point in getting out of bed in the morning if you don't leave the world a better place when you go to sleep? Love that. Um, there are a lot of comments in the chat thanking you for being so open um, and also mentioning your recent TED Talk, uh, which highlights the importance of dignity and personal accountability, which I think dovetails well to raising your hand and saying, should we really be investing yeah. in SUVs? Um, I can imagine if every board, every corporate board in America had at least two people who were willing to do that. And I think that a lot of that comes with uh, diversity of your board as well, is having different voices in the room. Um, can you share how you practice these principles in your professional life? Maybe not on as a board member, but as a producer um, or in other aspects of your professional life. Um, I have said no to offers to be a producer on projects that probably would have made money, but that um, I didn't feel were um, taking the right approach to a thing. Uh, I can name one, um, which was that uh, project with the Megan Kelly story um, out of Fox News. It was like, you know, you can polish this turd all you want. It's still a turd. Um, <laughs> but um, sorry. <laughs> um, so so you have to be able to say no to opportunity from time to time because it doesn't it doesn't resonate it, you know in a in the right way for you um and uh and i i try to um i'm willing to make less money on something if it means everybody's being appropriately paid i'm willing to make my profits be less or even break even on things if I know that in the process of, of making or creating something, people made a living, they learned something, so they're in a position to get a better job if this ever went away. I mean, if, if everybody involved with it got from point A to point B and was ready to move to point C, then I did a job that was very important even if I stopped working tomorrow. And that's how I'm trying to treat everything I'm doing. Got it. Um, there's a, a couple more questions about uh, some of the work you've done and a question about the Daphne Foundation specifically. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about how the Daphne Foundation has evolved in light of the most recent social justice movements mm -hmm. in the U.S.? That's a great question because actually, you know, philanthropy and foundation work is where I sort of started thinking about social justice and, um, and I was way into it um, up until the mid thousands um, when I started making film. And, um, and that was just at the moment where I was starting to think, it's not only that this isn't gonna fix anything, but that like, I think we may be reinforcing problems. Um, but one thing that was morphing at that, at that moment and really came to fruition in the mid 2000s and uh, in the last five to 10 years, um, has been the, the blossoming of, of movements and of organizing and community building. Um, and so, yeah, about 10 years ago, we decided to just pivot all of our work and support to movement building and community building. Um, you know, we always had that in our heads as something that was happening along with all the other direct service work. Um, but it really just feels like um, it's one thing to give somebody a bowl of soup there's the, that's that expression. I don't know if you ever heard it, but I got told it when I was early in my philanthropy process. There's this woman by, by the stream and some babies are drowning in the stream. So of course you run into the stream and you pull the babies out. That's charity. Then you run into the stream and you start teaching the babies to swim. That's philanthropy. Then you run upstream and figure out who's throwing babies in the river. So that's where the story always stopped. And that's human rights work, but that's not social justice work. 
because the difference between human rights work and social justice is in social justice, you don't see them as babies. They're full human beings and you don't need to save anyone. You need to give them what they lack to work, do the work themselves. And, um, and so that's kind of how my idea of this whole job has morphed as time has gone on and Daphne's really reflecting that. That's interesting. And I feel like, uh, hits on your passion for and pro proclivity towards storytelling. That was yeah. a really great anecdote. Um, there's some, a, a big fan out there of your podcast all years. Who's excited for Yay. season two. Um, I just interviewed David Byrne yesterday. How exciting was that? I think that this person is going to be thrilled and mm -hmm. wants to know that you, why you and your brother, Tim, uh, signed the Millionaires for Humanity le letter and what inspired you to sign? Um, well, because I'm for humanity. <laughs> my, my brother, Tim, is more recently kind of getting more public with his work and I'm so happy to have someone with me. It's kind of hard to do this all by yourself for so long. Um, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm taking advantage of every opportunity that comes to me to, to say this thing because it's so counterintuitive. Like every time somebody like me steps up and says, I'm not paying enough taxes, we're not working hard enough on behalf of poor people, it's, it's so wrong that it's that counterintuitive that I care more about the society more broadly than I care about my personal net worth. But as long as it's effective for me to say so, I'm never going to stop saying it. And by the way, everybody, all ears with Abigail Disney, season two coming. Um, next week, it's going to be on. We have Sam B on next week. And please spread the word because we need subscriptions and all that kind of thing. Where, where can they find this podcast? Anywhere you find your podcast. Okay, great. Um, and uh, Peter asks, as a writer director, I'm hoping to make a living in Hollywood. Not a, um, not a short, uh, a small dream. Um, but if I'm successful, I realize that probably that means I'll be working for a huge conglomerate media company. Is it possible to work for a Hollywood corporation without somehow being complicit in how the company could be hurting the culture? You know, this is the question of like, do you change things from the inside or do you change them from the outside? You know, and there's a lot of work being done on changing things from the outside. And the people who really do go in um, with an intention to change institutions and systems um, have a very hard job and it's a very unglorious job and they live a life of risk. Um, so my first reaction would be, well, if you wanna make a living, <laughs> Um, but if you want to make a comfortable living, uh, you're not going to be able to change anything inside of the Hollywood system. You just won't. Um, and uh, it's as industries go, it's pretty dirty one. Um, and so it, it goes a long way for a handful of people inside of the system, people like Meryl Streep and others who work inside of it and choose to be the best possible person that they can be, um, you know, in their orbit. Um, but if we want the Hollywood industrial complex to change and stop seeding, because I really do believe they seed the American public with ideas that are just poisonous. Um, if we want that to change, then, then we're gonna have to, the whole thing. I mean, honestly, I wanna just go set fire at every agency. <laughs> no, don't quote me on that. It's actionable. Um, but, uh, I, I think we're going to have to have a lot more than just one really good dedicated director. And if you feel uncomfortable selling yourself, I would stay independent. Thank you for that. And then in an attempt to um, stay positive in this final question before I hand it back to Mona, um, where do you look for inspiration to stay motivated uh, in these overwhelming times? Yeah, it's been hard, hasn't it? Oh, God, it's really hard. Um, what has always charged me up, always, um, is, is a check-in with what I'm doing and why I'm doing it and the people I'm doing it with. Where I get all my superpowers is from the relationships I've managed to build in my life doing work with low-income women and particularly low-income women of color. Um, I've made friendships of, of deep value to me. Um, they've helped me keep my head screwed on straight and they've helped me know when I'm losing my way. And, um, and I've seen all that they've been through and conquered. 
And so whenever I am inclined to be feeling sorry for myself, which I am now, by the way, because all of my kids are gone and I'm now all alone with COVID. And yeah, it's a nice house and there are a lot of books, but still I need people in it. Um, (laughs) But, you know, when I'm feeling sorry for myself, I remember my friend Lema and I remember how she faced down the warlords and and marched even though the president said he would kill everybody and 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 never stopped until she built peace in her country. If Lema can do that, then I can handle what I need to handle. Are you muted? I am muted. Um, <laughs> relationships are everything and I appreciate that a lot. Uh, Mona, there is actually one question for you before I hand it over to you. Um, there is a big fan of your art in the audience and they were wondering if you could share the name of the artist. And with that, I will hand it back to you to wrap up this Q&A. Thanks so much. Thank you, Madison. That was wonderfully done. Thank you so much. It's beautiful. Um, I, I, will, I will look at the back of that and I'll send it to you if you can share it. But Abby, you know, it has just been such an amazing conversation. I have deep, deep gratitude for being so honest and open and sharing your ideals. Um, I agree, relationships are everything. And I think that's become so evident. Um, And I love your framing of plenty. I agree. You know, a lot of people ask me, why did you leave Wall Street to do the work you do? You get, you know, banged up and and criticized all the time. And it's that notion of plenty, right? Is I have plenty and I can do more with my voice than I can do with my, sometimes the checkbook. Yeah. Um, But you are such a wonderful example of someone who has, used her privilege, you know, to be so visible and yet at your core, your humility just shines through. So I thank you for being able to hold that very special gift and um, and so candidly answering all the questions. Um, I also wanna say thank you for bringing Lema to Columbia because our students may not know that she has a big role at Columbia and uh, and truly, you know, you have to give yourself that acknowledgement that you really put her on that global scene. Yes, she did the work, I agree, but if you had not made that film, nobody would have really known about that work. So thank you for that. So this was a wonderful conversation. Uh, I'm grateful for you for making the time. Um, I hear you and I hope that your words have given our future business leaders a lot to think about. Thanks so much, Mona.